continuing our study in chapter 8, starting chapter 8 today. As you're turning there, would you please pray with me as we ask the Lord's help for today's text. Father, we come to you this morning, a people that are in constant need of your grace and your mercy and a people that have had that need greatly provided for in the person of Christ. Father, as we go to your word this morning, and we see what it is that you would say to us, I pray that it does not fall on deaf ears, nor does it fall on ears that seek just to gain knowledge and an intellectual understanding, but that it would land on our ears and our hearts that we would not go out from here unchanged, that you would impress on our hearts what it is that you would have us do from the truths that we read. Father, I pray, as always, that the words my brothers and sisters hear this morning are nothing at all of me and my wisdom or knowledge, but all of you through your Spirit. And we ask this in our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 8, <coughs> excuse me, will be in verses 1 through 6 this morning. Hebrews chapter 8, 1 through 6. And as you're still turning there, I will read that for us. The author of Hebrews says this He says, Now the point in what we are saying is this We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. In heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this high priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer offer gifts according to the law. They serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as he covenant, excuse me, as, as the old covenant, he, uh, he mediates is better. (laughs) We'll get through it since it is enacted on better promises. Well, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen? So probably at this point, um, if you're like me, you're reading this text, and you're getting a little bit of deja vu. And that really is uh, throughout the entire book of Hebrews. It is somewhat of a broken record in terms of the truths that are being preached. And one might ask, why the repetition? Why is there so much focus and so much time spent in this letter on talking about Christ being the the giver of a better covenant? And it's a good question. And I think that there's an, an immediate context that answers that, and I think that there is a greater application that answers that as well. The, the immediate context is that the author of this letter is undoing an entire system of belief. He's, 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 re, he's redoing, reforming, showing the fulfillment of an entire belief system that is incomplete, that was never meant to last. It was never meant to be the thing that people lived their lives through and put their hope in. It's an incomplete system. And he's dealing with a people that are attempting to live in a new covenant with old covenant rules. And what the author here is saying is that they don't mix. They were never supposed to mix. We were never supposed to have this old covenant be the eternal standard by which we lived. He's dealing with a people that are trying to figure out how do I take this system of belief that I have been raised with, 
that I have been raised to believe is good and right, and now you're saying that, that, that this entire system, it wasn't even the point. It was pointing to something. It's a shadow of a greater truth, a spiritual reality. And that's hard. That's hard to do. That's hard to understand when you have been brought up in a belief system that you realize either is wrong or in this case, this was pointing to something greater. That's a lot of work that has to be done. So the immediate context makes sense. The greater application is that I believe the author of this book knows we are a forgetful people. We are a people that have an in, it, it, that have it ingrained in our nature to attempt to hold on to the old covenant way of doing things. That I love the promises and, and the, the, the fulfillment and the assurance that the new covenant brings in Christ, but I have an innate pull toward the old covenant, toward doing things on my own, pulling myself up by my bootstraps. You tell me there's something to earn, I will earn it. Watch me. And one of the greatest struggles that we Christians can face on this earth is attempting to be our own priest. And what the author here is saying is that you can't. You were never meant to. It was always pointing to something greater. We want to earn what it is we receive. And we see that all the way in the garden. We see that ingrained in the nature in Adam and Eve. What happened after the the moment they realized that they had sinned, that they had fallen, their shame overtook them, what did they do? They made for themselves garments. They made for themselves covering. They felt the shame that the sin brings and they attempted to fix it on their own. We see it all the way back then, and we are no different. And I can speak to you from experience, more experience than I care to admit that I have. What happens when you have this mentality? What happens when you truly believe that your standing before God is dependent on you, your actions, your behavior? Is God happy with me this morning? Depends. It's a critical weight. And maybe this is you today. Maybe you are here this morning in Christ, but still trying to earn something that has already been provided for you. Maybe you are here this morning, not in Christ, and you believe that as long as I'm a good person, and at the end of the, at, at the, end of the day, as long as my good outweighed my bad, we're okay. Either way, this passage is for you. This passage is for all of us. Because all of us need to be reminded and saturated in the truth. In these truths. We need repetition. We need reminders. We need to know that there is nothing better to be reminded of than the gospel. And that's what the author here is preaching. Because here's the thing, my friends. I desperately want you to know this and believe this. You never outgrow your need for the gospel. You never outgrow your need to hear it. You never outgrow your need to have it applied to you. You never outgrow your need to be reminded of it, to have it ingrained into your soul. It is the core of what we believe. It is the core of who we are. We never outgrow our need to hear it. The gospel is not a one-time thing that once you hear it and you're saved, okay, good, we can move on to great, deeper and greater things. Without the gospel, there is no greater things. Without the gospel, there is nothing deep. Without the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is nothing. We must be reminded of it. And this entire book of Hebrews could be classified as a, as a Christological magnum opus. It's a perfect display of how the law 
the sacrificial system, the role of the priests themselves were mere shadows of a greater reality, of a greater spiritual truth. In short, the book of Hebrews proclaims that Christ is better. He's better. And therefore, we must be reminded of it. So, let us be reminded, starting in verse 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord has set up, and not man. As David stated last week, I thought it was a really, really incredible uh, word picture. Uh, There are no seats in the temple's holy place. There was no place to sit down. There was no place to get comfortable. Throw your feet up. Let your hair down. Relax a little bit. That was not what this place was for. That is not what the temple was for. This was the place of the Almighty, the dwelling place of God himself. The same God that shaped the world, the same God that gave the oceans their depth, the mountains their height, put the stars in their place in the sky, the same God that last week caused our sky to be riddled with beauty as we saw the northern lights And it was just a testament to God's handiwork. The same God that caused Isaiah upon experiencing a fraction of his glory to say, woe is me for I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips. The same God that said to Job out of the whirlwind in chapter 38, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without wisdom? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have an answer. That's the God of this temple. That is the God whose presence these priests had a duty to stand before on behalf of the people. Can you imagine entering this presence with the only hope that you have being your ability to follow the letter of the law? That you better make sure you have your I's dotted, your T's crossed, because you are entering into the presence of the Holy One, the Almighty, the Creator of the cosmos, and He suffers no jesters in His presence. Remember Aaron's sons? Aaron, the original priest, the one who started this whole thing, his sons Nadab and Abihu, they were consumed by fire in the presence of the Lord because they offered strange fire in his presence. They didn't take it seriously. And they were killed. This is important stuff. And the author of Hebrews understands that his recipients know this. The temple was serious. The tent of the Lord was serious. It was not something you entered into flippantly. Which is what makes this statement by the author, I believe Paul, let's just get it out there right now. I think it's Paul. It's what makes this statement so astounding. Not only is this priest in heaven, he's in the dwelling place of God, but he's sitting. He sits there. And not only is he sitting, but where is he sitting? Not in a dark corner of the room somewhere where he can't be seen. Not in a prostrate position. He's sitting at the right hand of what the author calls the majesty the holiness equal to the Almighty. He sits enthroned in heaven. My friends, this 
this truth would have been mind-blowing to the Hebrews who still understood and lived their, lived their lives so much in the context of the Old Covenant that your priest would dare to enter into the presence of God with so much confidence that he walks to the throne, sits next to it. It's amazing. It would have been unheard of. That priest would have died to have the gall to place himself even in the throne room of the Almighty. But Christ is better. Christ is better. It says that he sits enthroned in heaven as a what? As a minister in the true tent set up by the Lord, not by man. What the author is saying here to the people is that all you've known is shadows. All you've known are sinful copies. All you have seen are little glimpses of the greater reality that these shadows point to. All you have seen is an imperfect picture of a perfect truth. And what he's saying here is that the person of Jesus Christ, the priesthood in which he administers, is the clear and the perfect fulfillment of everything that you have known up to this point. It's as if you were viewing uh, the, the, the understanding that these truths were pointing to through a vivid dream. That if you ever had a very vivid dream and you wake up and you remember, like right when you wake up, you remember everything, but the longer you're awake, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, it fades and you lose it and you forget. And then all you have is just kind of a, this weird shaped uh, sort of understanding of what you had just dreamed. It's like that. That's what the old covenant pointed to. It was like a vivid dream pointing to a greater, truer reality. It was never meant to be permanent. The tent was always pointing to the throne where a priest sits who never fails in his duty to minister to his people. He does the work of a priest perfectly. He mediates for his people perfectly. He cares for his people perfectly. He goes to the Father on behalf of the people perfectly. What does Romans 8.34 says? It says, who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us all. Your Savior, my friends, if you are in Christ, your Savior is at this moment seated at the right hand of God, interceding perfectly and personally for you on behalf of the Father. He knows your name. He knows your faults. He knows your failures. He knows your wants, your desires. He knows the ways that you have strived to be like Christ and fallen flat on your face. He understands it all and he mediates perfectly. For you, to the eyes of holiness. His ministry did not end when he ascended into the heavens. He ascended to the place of mediation, where he sits and he does work. And he works on behalf of his people. And he does so perfectly. This is our priest. This is the one that we call brother. This is our savior. The one who works on our behalf. Verse 3 says, For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. As already has been covered by David so well, Jesus was not in the the Levitical line for the priesthood. 
He, he, wasn't, he didn't have the bloodline. He didn't have the pedigree, if it were. He came from the line of Judah. He would not have met the earthly requirements to fulfill that role. It's because his role is of a different order, a greater order, a truer order. What the author is saying here is that if sacrifices were determined by the law, and now in this new covenant we were still bound to the law and the law's understanding of how we are justified before a holy God, we wouldn't need Christ because we have everything here that the law requires. We've got it covered. We have the lineage, we have the traditions, we have the animals, we have the altar, we have the ability to shed blood, we have the law. Why do we need something better? Why do we need something greater? If all it takes is for sacrifices to be made and blood to be spilt, we can spill blood all day. It's not the issue. The issue is it was never meant to be permanent. It was never meant to be the thing that we put our hopes into for eternity. It was never meant to be the final understanding of how a people are reconciled to a holy God. It was a picture, a shadow. And as verse 5 says, it says, these things serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And this is where the broken record starts to be broken again as we begin to preach and to hear truths that we have been preaching and hearing throughout this entire book. That the law was never meant to be the means the ultimate means of salvation because we can't keep it. It was never meant to be the the thing that we put all of our hopes into and pray that we can somehow follow this as close to the letter as possible and at the end of the day, we hope it's enough. It was always meant to point us to the one that casts the shadow, Jesus Christ. The temple that held the place where God indwelled, my friends, is now here. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, His people. The sacrifices that were done on the altar and the river of blood that would literally flow from the temple down. It's the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of the new covenant that takes away the sins of the world. It was pointing to something. Blood had to be spilt. The priest going before God on behalf of the people was a shadow and a picture of a great and perfect high priest that goes before God on behalf of the people every moment. You know... I was talking with Pastor Andrew last week after uh, David's sermon about the almost theatric imagery that occurs upon the death of Jesus Christ and how we have the Savior of the world, God incarnate, crucified to a tree, screams in agony, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Proclaims it is finished and dies. And upon that moment, the ground begins to shake. The sky goes dark. And the one thing that separated the eyes of the perfect from the profane, the curtain into the Holy of Holies, was not simply put aside It was split, torn asunder from top to bottom. And this wasn't some thin veil. The curtain that separated it was thick. And God said, it's no longer needed. The purpose that this veil had to separate 
my eyes from you now is embodied in a perfect person. And I don't need this anymore. Enter in with confidence. Not confidence in your own doing. Not confidence in your ability to take and keep the law. Not confidence in the cleanliness of your shoes or the brightness of your robes. Confidence in the one perfect priest that grabs you by the arm, leads you in, and says, Make your case. Plead your requests. Ask, plead, and pray. And know that your Father hears you perfectly because Jesus Christ is better. Can you imagine being a priest in the temple when this event occurred? And the thing that you have held so much reverence for your entire life is ripped from top to bottom by invisible hands. The earth shakes, the sky goes dark, the holiness of holy places is exposed to the eye of sinful man. He would have thought the world was ending. And in a way it was. For there was a proclamation that the old ways are done, the old ways have been fulfilled, and there is now a new covenant. The shadow had been fulfilled as the Son of God who cast that shadow accomplished the will of his Father once and for all. And when we look at the promises of the law, what the law is, what the law is for, one of the primary things that we should see as God's people is how the law of God points to Jesus. It points to Jesus. And you can go through the entirety of the law and bullet point by bullet point see how Christ has perfectly fulfilled it on your behalf. When we look to the law, we should see that Christ is better because he is. Verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. The Father's covenant with us is no longer one that requires us to make sure that we clean ourselves up, that we make sure you better have this law ingrained in your head so that you are able to live a life that is holy. The covenant is no longer one that orders us to pitch a tent, make a sacrifice, say the right words. It's a better covenant. It's a better promise. It's not one that has taken the law and says, okay, no longer needed. We don't need the law anymore because we're under grace. We're not antinomians in this church. We believe the law of God is good and right, but it is to be viewed and understood in the context of the new covenant. That we are to view the law, why we strive, why we follow the principles of the Lord, is it to earn your way to heaven or is it because Christ has already done it for you and you live in that gratitude and in that thankfulness? You saved me from damnation itself. Of course, I will live for you. We must understand the law in its proper context because the covenant that Christ has now the new covenant, the better covenant. It is one that is full of grace and mercy. It's one that bids us, O sinner, dead and ruined, cling not to the robes of your works, for they contribute nothing but the need for saving. But here, take this, the righteous robes of a better promise, a promise that is found in Jesus Christ. 
my friend, there is no fear in this promise. There is no dread in this covenant. This covenant offers freedom from bondage. A bondage that that yoked us to our sinful natures. A bondage from constantly having to be worried and fearful. For the eyes of holiness were ever upon us. There is freedom found in this covenant. Because it is better. And one of the best things about this covenant, there's so many good things. One of the best things is we no longer need to worry about the worthiness of our priest. I no longer need to worry that I'm going to have some Nadab or Abihu go into the tent on my behalf and get torched. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry that the, pre- that, uh, that the priest follows every dot and follows every rule because it's Jesus. His mediation is perfect. His fulfillment of the law is perfect. His sacrifice is perfect. His understanding of what his people need every single moment of their lives is perfect because he is perfect. And there's no longer a need to long for what the shadows represent. There's no longer a need to, 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 to look at these things and these systems that God put in place and say, what are, what are they pointing to? What is it that we are supposed to understand from looking at this? We know. It's Christ. And Christ is better. Like Paul said to Antioch in Acts chapter 13, he said, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The perfect priest, Jesus Christ, accomplishes his promises perfectly. He fulfills the old covenant perfectly. Every aspect of it is wonderfully fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. We must believe this as Christians. We cannot be living our lives in a new covenant, playing by old covenant rules. It doesn't work. Because when you try to do that, you place yourself in the position of priest. Jesus is better than you. He's better than me. He's better at being a priest than you could ever be. Always. And as we come to a close, it's important, my friends, that as we read through these truths and we are faced again with the repetition of them, we ask ourselves, how then shall we live? If I am called to live a life that is wholly reliant upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not my own, if I am called to look at the promises made in Scripture as pointing to a greater reality, what then shall I do? How then shall I live? And I have three points of application for those that are taking notes. Two apply to the Christian, and one applies to the non-Christian. First, to you that are in Christ, I would admonish you to not view the gospel as simply a one-time need. Do not put the gospel in a box that you place at the beginning of your Christian walk and it stays there. Your entire life upon regeneration to entering in to the glorious gates of heaven should be saturated by the gospel. That you never outgrow your need to be hammered 
with the truth of the gospel. That you are in great need of a savior. And you have had a savior that has provided so perfectly for that great need. Don't make the mistake, as I did for many years, of just thinking that the gospel was something that saved me, and then after that, I'm on my own. It's not. We are in constant need of the same grace that saved us until the day that we die. Don't fall into that trap. Second, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, don't live an old covenant life in a new covenant reality. It's hard. It's very difficult because the weight that that places on your shoulders is not a weight that you were designed or meant to bear. It's a weight that has been perfectly provided for in the person of Jesus Christ. And every time you begin to fall back into that lifestyle of thinking, I am responsible for brushing myself off. I am responsible for making sure that I'm worthy to come to the Father you are taking on yourself responsibilities that are meant for Christ and that have been fulfilled by Christ perfectly. That does not mean that now we have been saved, we can do whatever we want. Free grace. Grace is free. I can live however I feel like. By no means. We do not sin that grace may abound. We do not sin in order that the promises of the new covenant might be manifest in our lives. Put away your attempts of earning God's favor through sacrifice. Because those sacrifices are only shadows. And the true and the better sacrifice has already been made on your behalf. Once and for all. Your Savior, Jesus Christ, holds your election, your salvation, your justification, your sanctification. And will see the work done till you are glorified in heaven. Because his promises are perfect. Your entire life is held together by the power of Jesus Christ. So live like it. Third, finally, if you are here this morning and you are not in Christ, you are still bound by the rules of the law. If you do not have Christ as your mediating Savior, if you do not have Christ as your priest, then it's up to you. It is up to you to make sure that you have everything the way that it should be. It's up to you to make sure that you make the right sacrifices, you live the right ways, And that you don't sin once. That is up to you. My friends, there's no hope in that. There isn't supposed to be hope in that. Your standing before the Almighty without Jesus Christ is completely dependent upon your life. The law demands what you can't do. The law demands that you be perfect. Not just a good person. Not just living a life that does more good than bad. Do you realize that one of Satan's greatest ploys is to convince you to trust in good morals? If he can get you to be a good person by the standards of the world, he's won. Satan does not always deceive people by causing them to to divert into destructive lifestyles, into drugs and alcohol. Things of that sort. The vast majority of people he has believing. I live a pretty good life. I do more good than I do bad. And they're on the same pathway to a Christless eternity. The only reality that awaits you is an eternity separated from the love and the peace that Christ brings. And an all-consuming presence of God's wrath and judgment. Without Christ, that is the reality. But my friends, there is hope. There is great hope that is found in Jesus Christ. 
You have heard us proclaim it this entire book. That at this moment, today, if you find yourself trying to earn God's favor, if you, try, if you find yourself trying to live a life that's just good enough, I don't care if you are nine years old, I don't care if you're 90 years old, the rules remain the same. Your only hope of salvation and life eternal after this life is found in the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no other means of salvation. Nothing. You can't do it. Buddha can't do it. Mohammed can't do it. A good life can't do it. Nobody. Except Jesus Christ. So today is the day of salvation. Put away all your attempts to earn God's favor. Repent and believe upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. And today salvation can be yours. And these promises that we speak of will be yours everlasting. My Redeemer family. As one of your pastors, one of my greatest desires for you is that you would never tire of hearing the gospel. That it would always stir in you such a fire and a yearning to know more and deeper the love that Jesus Christ has for you and the way that he has perfectly mediated on your behalf. To have a deeper and and greater understanding of how exactly does my Savior mediate for me? How has he perfectly fulfilled the law? How has he done these things? Richard Sibbs, the author of The Bruised Reed, which is an excellent book, by the way. I would suggest reading it. Um, He says this. He says, God knows we have nothing of ourselves. Therefore, in the covenant of grace, he requires no more than he gives. But he gives what he requires And he accepts what he gives. I love that quote. Because in that we see the glorious nature of the gospel. That it has been enacted. It has been proclaimed. It has been satisfied. And it is held together by the power of Jesus Christ. And there is nothing more glorious to hear in our ears than the truth of this better promise. I want you to know, first and foremost, my friends, that your salvation, your sanctification, the promise of your glorification is held together by the all-powerful, sufficient Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is nothing that you can do to shake that power. No matter your fear, no matter your pain, no matter your doubt or your failings, If our trust is in the perfect work of Jesus Christ, you will not be separated from his love because God does not lose those who he has chosen because his promises are better and he has promised you that. So live. Live. Not in the shadow of the law's bondage, Not in a way that holds on to the old covenant in a way that it was never meant to be held on to. But live in the freedom that is found in the better promise. The one who casts the shadow. The Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father, there is no greater truth to have repeated again and again in our ears. Oh, that we would be a people that would never grow tired of hearing the great and glorious gospel proclaimed to us. Father, I ask that you please give us the grace as your people to not leave here unchanged that we would not presume upon this great grace that we have been given, but that because of it, it would motivate us to be Christians of the book, to be Christians that seek to live their lives in such accordance to the word of God. 
Not because we try to earn your favor, but because Christ has done it for us. Father, please give us the correct motives when we seek to live for you. Father, I want to pray for the members here at Redeemer that you would give them the courage, that you would give them grace, and you would give them peace that comes from their salvation, that they would trust in you and in the work that Christ has done on their behalf, and that that would motivate them to live lives for you. Father, I pray that your word and your gospel will go out from here, not just today, but as long as these doors are open, that there is great life to be found in the promises of Jesus Christ. As we live our lives, Father, as we reach closer and closer to eternity with you, I pray that you would impress on our hearts and our minds all the more that Christ is better. Please go with us this week as we enter into the world. Please give us courage and grace to proclaim this truth, not only with our words, but with our lives. We ask all these things in the name of our great and glorious King, Jesus Christ. Amen.